We have a really fun interview today with Jacques Martiquet, who is the party scientist. Uh, this is one of the kinds of interviews I really love because we just got to geek out on social science and social design for an hour. We went over an hour. This, you know it's a good one when we go over time. Jacques works with all different kinds of groups and teams. He had previous clients like Lush, Lululemon, and Vision Festival, Shambhala Music Festival. Uh, he works with universities, and he really focuses on creating social experiences that connect people, that are highly memorable, that create peak moments. And he walks us through his process today of what it takes to create really compelling events and experiences. We talk about both online experiences in today's virtual world and how you can bring some of the incredible elements that he's learned from offline experiences into the virtual world. There's just so much practical, actionable things that you'll be able to apply to your community from this one, whether you're hosting events or just trying to improve your onboarding for your forums, just things that, uh, for whatever reason, a lot of community builders don't always think about, uh, but are, are extremely important for making your your experiences more compelling. And they're not that hard a lot of the time. They can be really simple things like making sure that when you bring new people into an event that you're hosting online, have a pause because they're probably coming from another event or a call or something. They just clicked, you know, open Zoom and there they are. So always starting with a pause and having people become more aware of themselves and become aware of each other will help them be more present with the event and come in with what he calls a pro-social uh, state or pro-social mentality where you're ready to be social and you're ready to have a positive impact on the group. There's so much in there. You're going to love it. Uh, real quick, we want to give a shout out to another person who dropped a review of the podcast. We really appreciate all the reviews. And if you do add a review to Apple Podcasts, we may read it out here live on the podcast. This one is from Ray922. He said, best community content. The list of podcast guests is super impressive. It's really great to see a diverse range of perspectives. These sessions are relevant for anyone building their career in marketing as community becomes more critical for businesses to thrive. Really appreciate the review, Ray. Again, these reviews help us in a huge way to have this podcast reach more people. So please take a moment, pause the podcast right now, just write a couple sentences on Apple Podcasts or anywhere that you listen to podcasts. That's a huge help. All right, without further ado, let's dive in. All right, Jacques, welcome to the show. Woo. David, it's nice to be geeking out with you today. For those who, of you who are listening in on the podcast, uh, Jacques has come prepared with his, his staple purple... Uh, sequin tie and his scientist coat. I, I imagine it's it's a regular. Oh, it literally says a party scientist on the back. I'm I'm starting to think he might wear this stuff often. Uh, Jacques, I'm very excited to chat. I, I don't think I've had anyone come so visually prepared to the podcast before. Um, and and really already, I before we even hit record, you're already asking me if I'm feeling ready to kick off the podcast and if I needed to do any warm up. So you are already practicing what you preach as the party scientist. Um, and why don't we just start there? What does it mean to be a party scientist? You know, it first begins with the dress code. Of course. No. <laughs> um, yeah, David. Well, I, I just first want to say that yeah, I really believe community is a medicine, and uh, my my life's work has been how to design really nourishing, meaningful, shared moments. So moments where we come together, we look around, we feel completely accepted, we feel like we, we can really experience joy, and we can really express ourselves. I'm really interested in the principles of these experiences and I'm also interested in the the public health implications of these experiences and I'm sure you're wondering if you're listening like gosh it's COVID uh, why is Jacques talking about partying and public health because uh, right now they're very much um, you know in incongruous <laughs> but yeah I, I would say what what a party scientist does and I hope there's more party scientists out there eventually is a party scientist leverages 
ancient social technologies like dance, singing, and laughter to promote healthy and happy uh, community. I love that. <laughs> so dance, singing, and laughter are ancient practices. Say more about that. Where I've never heard anyone reference those things in that way. Yeah, yeah. So as facilitators, as community builders, we have access to social technologies. We're aware of icebreakers. We're aware of games, prompts, sentence stems, different activities that we can use in our communities to really cultivate a belonging and acceptance and just more intentionality with how we gather. Uh, dancing, singing, and laughter are hardwired into us um, to promote social ties. And so one of my favorite quotes is, I mean, you can vary it quite a lot, but the distance between two humans is a laugh or uh, a dance move or, you know, a sing-along. What I've found in leading hundreds of experiences in multiple different countries is that laughter is this universal human social bonding uh, behavior and then also singing and dance especially Whitney Houston I will always love you if you've heard that before the universal David. language <laughs> <laughs> yeah and and of course these are historically significant I mean one evolutionary psychologist hypothesizes that what replaced grooming where we used to touch each other and and that's another really important part of human connection is the touch. But grooming, when chimpanzees used to take the, uh, the bugs off each other, they hypothesized that grooming was replaced with singing and dance as a social bonding uh, and trust-building behavior so that humans could survive. Hmm. Hmm, I love that. Yeah, and it's immediately yeah. making me think of all the communities that exist today that lack those three things. Um, every professional community, most online yeah. communities. Well, I guess online communities will have laughter, um, memes and jokes and inside jokes in, mm -hmm. in online forums, but a lot of them don't. A lot of them are just like very professional. Maybe that's part of why it feels hard sometimes to build community in professional spaces because it's lacking some of that more playful engagement. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I, I think of leadership as what threshold of expression are we uh, creating in a room of people? What level of expression is allowed and celebrated in an environment? And I think that in a lot of these formal, I, I think formality and professionalism is oftentimes uh, the opposite of authenticity and the the opposite of like this lightheartedness when we're when we're taking ourselves less seriously that's when we truly get creative and that's when we build social ties uh and so yeah i i agree with you and perhaps uh this is why i hang out with burners <laughs> i guess so i mean like sometimes i guess like i've been to conferences where they try to you know introduce dance and song and and stuff and it can be kind of awkward i, I can't help but fun. Im, yeah i can't help but imagine that um well, it was a microsoft event with uh where they're like dancing on stage and trying to amp everyone up and it was like the most awkward it like went viral because of how awkward it was oh, um so so tell me more about how like the work that you actually do because so you you host parties you organize parties i think you work with businesses and different groups as well to help them put together more compelling experiences and events as well. Um, tell me more about the work that you do as the party scientist. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I first just want to comment on what you've said with that Microsoft event. I think that it's risky to do a lot of these things. Mm -hmm. um, and I think what's really important is for people to have a shared intention and shared expectations. And I think that event was probably really awkward because people did not expect for that expression to be encouraged. Uh, people did not expect that. They're, they were in the headspace of, you know, we're here for work, we're here for mm -hmm. networking. So, and I've been in a situation like that with a corporation where 
they didn't know who I was and what I was going to facilitate. <laughs> and they were just dropped off the deep end. And, mm. you know, they don't even have an agreement within the community. You know, we're both big fans of proactive community agreements. Well, if that agreement isn't there that I'm not going to lose my status by dancing like an idiot on stage, then people may not feel as safe to do it. Right. Yeah. So yeah. Steve Ballmer needed to set a better environment and expectation <sighs> that, hey, we're all going to let loose and this is going to be a different kind of event. Maybe then it would have been less awkward and people would have engaged and joined or got on stage, but they didn't. And so it wasn't. Definitely. Definitely. And and I love that you point out the importance of role modeling. But I, I really think what's what's hindering expression and joy and fun and play is this kind of I feel like it's this this competitiveness. We we and we, we also have this idea that um, to be serious is to be productive. And mm. if you're serious that means you get work done. And oftentimes, and I study positive emotions, like I study how joy can increase our productivity, but also increase our uh, social ties and just our intrinsic motivation, right? People listening on this, we want our community members to be intrinsically motivated, not extrinsically motivated. Although we do use incentive structures, um, that intrinsic motivation comes from the enjoyability of the task. And uh, mm. ultimately, I, I think that uh, we need to see joy as a productivity hack and something that is so important for our performance um, within organizations. Absolutely. And you previously went to school for pharmacology and public health. Um, how do you connect those things to the work of building community and, you know, creating joy yeah. through these experiences. Yeah, I mean, I'm just a total nerd, David, about <laughs> longevity and about positive psychology. And I remember taking a Coursera course on positive psychology and it's a two minute video. It's like, remember these three words from this entire course. And it's like, other people matter. <laughs> um, so I'm, I really define the good life as the quality of our relationships and mm. shared experiences. And I know as well that one of the greatest stress preventives is oxytocin, the social mm. bonding neurochemical. And it turns out that oxytocin is released through eye contact. It's released through touch. Uh, and, you know, in this virtual space, it's hard. We still get a little bit of it, but it's hard to access that same stress reduction. Mm. But ultimately, uh, human connection is an elixir of life. And that's that's truly my core life philosophy. And so when I'm out in the world, I'm I'm really thinking about the quality of my interactions because I know it's so important to my well-being and to my physical health as well. Uh, and, mm. you know, if anyone wants to read more into the research on this, uh, you can check out any book about centenarians, the people who live to their 100. Um, and you'll see that these people in these villages in Pakistan, well, no longer because what has happened is modern modernism has reached these communities and now mm. uh, cancer and diabetes and heart disease are present. But what you'll find is people have nothing, but they have each other. They eat together, they garden together, and they live so happily. Hmm. And that's that's when I've started to take my human connections more seriously. That's super interesting. Is there a specific book that you recommend on that? I'm, I'm very curious. Yeah, definitely. There's this book called Healthy at 100 by John Robbins. And it really challenges um, it challenges this idea that we 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 need certain physical things we need certain a certain level of wealth to truly be happy right. um, so it's it's very intriguing it really kind of questions the uh, definition of success over here in Western culture hmm yeah I love it 
And you touched on this, and I'm curious to dive into it a little more on what we're missing when we're working in these Zoom online environments. Um, I've kind of experienced it and observed it that, you know, the kind of connection that we feel and have with each other through virtual platforms is is missing mm. something. And it sounds like you have a perspective from a, from a scientific background on literally like the lack of eye contact, not being able to look each other in the eyes, uh, impacting the, you know, oxytocin that your body has in it. Um, are there other specific examples of how virtual interactions isn't providing yeah. the same kind of physical response that we get from in-person interactions? Yeah, definitely. I, I would just summarize all of that on the the fidelity of the empathetic highway. Like, uh, how much empathy can we experience mm. when we're connecting virtually? And ultimately, uh, when we're present with each other, we we can out, like our bodies are designed to pick up tension and pick up these nonverbal cues, which mm. is way below our conscious awareness um so you know for one thing i mean we can like for you you may have noticed i look at the camera a lot as a habit um so i i try to give people eye contact when i'm on zoom um but for one thing so the just, eye contact, you're just giving me all the oxytocin you're like you have it you keep it. I, don't... I don't need any i'm not even gonna look at your face i'm gonna look at this dark abyss i put actually uh a uh, little um, squiggly eyes uh, on my camera so that I have something to uh, look at when when I'm on calls like this, and and yeah. that's that's been my solution. Well, it's it's crazy, David. So some of the research that I've encountered is that video calls um, video calls are distracting, and actually uh, they're less they're less intimate because we're distracted by the video. Um, and so one researcher, I forget from what book, but it was a book about, uh, I think networking or human connection. She says that phone calls, uh, you can be much more present than on video calls. And so oftentimes I will, uh, well, I'll hide my self view of course, and I'll hide most other faces and I'll just, mm -hmm be tuned in to the tonality. The tonality of the voice is so important. One of my mantras is, uh, it's not what you say, it's how you feel when you say it, which mm. really creates the most closeness in our human connections. Mm. Um, but yeah, ultimately, David, when, when we're on screens, uh, we don't have that aura. We don't sense each other's, uh, other's aura, which actually comes from the... Uh, electromagnetism of our hearts and this is actually science-based this isn't no quantum physics preaching hippie right here okay i promise <laughs> <laughs> and then of course there's the eye contact and then i think uh it's it's difficult david and i am curious to explore this with you but i really think touch is touches this really nourishing thing but in workplaces in professional contexts you know, really um, it's touching so it. sensitive. Yeah. It's so sensitive. And yeah. yet it's how we're wired. We're wired to synchronize when we touch each other. Yeah. Um, so it's, it's really interesting that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I guess high five in with the sales team only gets you so far, you know, but, mm -hmm. uh, uh, online, you definitely lack that. I think about smell as well. Mm. Uh, smell is so powerful and not just smelling the other person. Sure. That's part of it. <laughs> but smelling the environment and how that affects mm. all the people in that environment. You know, think about sitting in a group circle in a library and how that makes you and everyone feel versus being outside in a field yeah. and how that makes yeah. you feel like the smell in the room affects everybody. Mm. Um, you know, the, the visual cues, there's mannerisms in the face that I don't think we pick up on video calls. I think, are positioning in a room amongst a group of people. Is everyone all looking at one person? Uh, are they looking around and, and kind of dazed off? You can't yeah. tell where, who people are. Everyone's looking at the screen 
in a zoom. They're not all looking towards the person. You, you can't see them shift in their seat in the same way. So there's all these very subtle things that um, are even, you know, more obvious than things like electromagnetic fields, which I don't yeah. disagree that that's absolutely going to have an, an impact on, you know, the, the physical nature of being around other people. So I, I, I love I, that. I want to just encapsulate it's it's the shared context. Mm -hmm. I, I love that you point out the environment mm -hmm. because, yeah, one of my principles is how do we create a shared intention, a, a shared a shared reality um, in our gatherings. And part of that is having people exit what they're doing, exit their other reality and enter a new context. Mm -hmm. And I think a leadership skill in our communication is explicitly creating the context for a meeting. Um, and so going back to this example with Microsoft, perhaps that context was missing and that's why it was awkward, right? Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Setting the right environment that has people have a shared experience. Mm -hmm. um, I mm -hmm. want to dive into some specific examples of how you've applied this to virtual events, but um, if we could first zoom out, I would love to hear, you know, what your framework is or how you think about your template for organizing an event or experience or party. Like what are the, the pillars that yeah. go into it? And what I'd love is if you could take that framework and show us how it has played out in a uh, real world event that you think was really compelling that you've hosted. And then we can move into how you've applied it to virtual events and see kind of where the differences or, or similarities are. So yeah. yeah, starting with just kind of like, what is your framework? Right on. So I, I think there's two, two sciences here. There's the science of experience design, and then there's the science of facilitation. Mm. What, what I really dream about is not requiring any sort of sophisticated sound systems or aesthetic or expensive things. Like I, I just want to be able to get a group of people into a huddle and create belonging and drop people into activities that create those social ties. So in my in my corporate work and my festival work, there's there's a lot of planning that goes into it. Um, when I'm designing an experience, uh, the experience begins before the experience. And this is what Priya Parker shows us is mm -hmm. that the invitation, the context, the intention, the shared purpose. This is all incredibly important when we're designing a gathering. Um, and what, what I really love to do, and this is what I do in my virtual corporate experiences, I prepare people to benefit from the experience. So I often have a, a little checklist. I'll have a checklist for my participants and I'll, I'll tell them what they need to benefit the most from this experience. Mm. And then when the experience actually begins, I'll, I'll share a few, a few principles for, mm. for people listening who are facilitating, who might be leading a group. Uh, that. That's truly my specialty. But before so, you dive into that, I'm curious yeah. on, on the checklist, can you share an example Definitely. of like, what are some of the things on a checklist that you would give to somebody? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So I often have people um, so basically set up their tech for virtual events. Sure. Um, I'll have people, uh, I'll give people accurate expectations as to what they're doing. I'll make sure they bring the right equipment mm -hmm. uh, that they need. And then... Uh, yeah, what I, what I really would like to do is show people what they're going to experience before they experience it. Hmm. And I think that's really important just to not throw people off the deep end. We want people to not have this sense of uncertainty. Hmm. Uh, and then, you know, beyond, beyond that, uh, I think what's really important is, so I, before I begin my experiences, I actually go through 
community agreements and I'll talk about confidentiality. I'll talk about some some core beliefs that my participants are going to practice in the session. Uh, one of my favorite one of these statements is uh, everyone is an infinite source of positive joy and energy. Uh, yeah, it's we see ourselves as limitless sources of joy and positive energy. And so I, I just get everyone to give that a thumbs up because oftentimes we we think that we're just not that way. We're not wired that way. Um, what I also do as a ritual uh, before beginning any sort of experience is I get people to uh, say to someone eye to eye, uh, when you express yourself, I feel permission to express myself. And mm. it's, it's kind of weird, it's kind of culty maybe, but it's really important because ultimately um, that's how we create permission for people to be themselves, is we express ourselves first. And so those are a few of the statements and whatnot. Um, and then uh, and then kind of the experience will begin with with a few different rituals, getting people into a, a good mood. And I, I think mood is really important. Our, our mood and physiological state when we step into a gathering is predicts the quality of our engagement, the quality of our connections. Yeah. Um, and so often we're just kind of slouching in our chair and like, you know, maybe we're stressed and we just take that, we take all of that into the experience with us, right? Absolutely. Yeah, I, yeah. I, I love how you set the context. Um, I actually like what you said about removing uncertainty because I think it's actually not how a lot of people think about events and community experiences. For some reason, a lot of us have it in our mind that we we want to create this surprise or this great unveiling for people. Um, we like design events around like the Apple launch where it's like, you don't know what's going to be there. Like it's going to be this huge, exciting announcement. But the reality is most of our announcements aren't going to be fancy new iPhones. Um, and what that actually does is create uncertainty and discomfort for people who like don't know what they're getting into. But if you can create that clarity for people up front, they can actually show up with better attitudes, more awareness, they're more prepared emotionally, literally having the right gear. If it's a physical event, it's, you know, what are you wearing? Are you wearing the right shoes? Are you wearing the right outfit? Are you going to fit in? Um, all that kind of stuff. So I love that distinction of providing that clarity before the event. Don't, don't make people mm. guess anything. Yeah. Yeah. The question is, how can we, well, I think one important element too, as, as gatherers is how do we cultivate trust and credibility before the experience so that people can relax? We mm -hmm. want people to be able to relax into the roller coaster of our experience. Mm. Right. And, uh, so if people don't trust the party scientist and they don't trust his science they're going to be like why are we doing this this is yeah. just play and this is a waste of time but if they know that it's very much based in social science social bonding science and they know my track record and they know why we're doing it this is the other thing it's like what are the reasons do what reasons do people have to fully participate in our gatherings Mm -hmm. And so I, I give people those reasons. I talk about all the literature on social bonding and I, I talk about the power of joy and the stress relieving effects of, of joy and how how it's, you know, it's not just that we're doing this for fun. This is like a wellness class, mm -hmm. but it's it's going to be fun. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, some people don't aren't too hot on CrossFit or yoga or Mind, mindfulness is not fun sometimes if you sure. have a mind, right? <laughs> Definitely. Usually not. <laughs> yeah. 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 But, but just, you know, tagging along your last question, your last question, David, is um, the, the importance, one, one thing I want to point out is the importance of some pause in your gathering where people actually enter your gathering and leave the fast-paced, rushed, stressed world of, you know, mm. maybe 
you know, I don't want to make it broad, but kind of mainstream city life, perhaps. Um, so that liminal space, liminal spaces prepare people, they, they enable people to let go of their responsibilities, their thoughts, their stresses, so that they can be fully present in mm. the experience. And oftentimes we just don't, we don't have any sort of pause mm. um, to begin our gatherings. We don't, you know, that's it's too uh, meditative, you know, it's too... Too crunchy. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and so the importance of, of having, giving people a second to just like give up and enter a new reality is, is really important. I, I love that. Um, I love the crunch. Like I, I, you're, you're putting words to things that I've learned, I think over time, just through experience. And um, I think it's absolutely critical what you're describing. And, and even if it feels weird, that's actually better because it gets people out of their comfort zone. It kind of recreates reality in a way that makes them feel it, it, it does cut them off from, you know, the work that they did right before that. And in online events, you're literally sometimes getting right off a call and just clicking the button. Yeah. Now you're in this one. It's a completely different context, but their brain's still in the same space. So I love the idea of having a pause. Um, a couple of ways that I've done that in the past um, in both virtual and in-person events is sometimes I just do uh, three deep breaths together. So I love doing it in the conference. Yeah. There's like nothing better to me than like, standing in front of a thousand people at a conference and getting everyone to breathe in for three seconds and out for three seconds, just all together. And then just like, and I have everyone close their eyes and then I have them open their eyes and I open my eyes. I do it with them and just seeing the looks on everyone's faces. Like at first when I say like, Hey, we're going to do a breathing exercise. They all get this awkward, like, eh, cool. This is weird. <laughs> and then afterward, just the calm on everyone's face. And I, and then I always ask like, how does that feel? And you just hear like a, like not even words, just like, mm. <laughs> um, so yeah. I've been doing that, that just breathing exercise, really simple, three deep breaths with everyone in the event. And then another one I've been doing, especially for online events, is the ceremonial closing of tabs. So I'll bring out a singing bowl and I hit the singing bowl and I hit it three <laughs> times and give them an opportunity to close down Slack yeah. and email and all their tabs. And um, I, I I can't even take credit for the idea, but like I completely forget who I learned it from. Um, mm. But I've been doing it all the time, and it's great. I do it in like workshops. Like I'll go into a big professional company where again they expect it to be very serious, and then like I'm this guy coming up with a singing bowl and ceremonial closing of tabs. But like you just again see the looks on people's faces of like oh this is unique. This is and and it centers themselves and makes them aware of their their settings and their surroundings. Um, so I, I love that. And I love what you shared. You shared um, uh, having people reflect on themselves to say that they're infinite sources of joy. I think, you know, what I'm pulling from that is like it makes them aware of their own role in in the events. And then the eye contact and having them say, when you share your experience, that makes me feel comfortable sharing mine. That kind of makes them aware of each other's role and their their interconnectedness. So it, like I'm trying to like distill down a little bit, like are there a few things that you really try to accomplish through the pause and the kinds of rituals that you set up for these events? And maybe you have different questions or different formats for it, but the, the ultimate goals are the same. Yeah, yeah. Well, the word coming to mind is embodiment and getting people to just take a second to relax and notice what is going on in their bodies. Notice their nervous system. I, I think, you know, what you're doing with the, the slow, deep breaths is yeah, you're, you're activating, you're activating what I call the pro social state. And mm. when we're in a pro social state, we're just less easily triggered. We're slower and we're more, we're more able to give others our attention. And so how I begin all my events is with some form of ritual just to relax people's nervous system so that they're in a pro-social state. Mm. Um, 
and and I really define it as twofold, right? Like there's relaxation and then there's joy, right? And for me, you know, I I stimulate joy. I get people to feel joyful after they're more relaxed, um, usually through music or just through, you know, a quick little game. One thing I'll do on virtual events is I'll get people to simply... Um, I'll, I'll put on a song called the hallelujah song. It goes <laughs> hallelujah. And it's really simple. It's like everyone grabs two random items and uh, just waves them for a second. <laughs> um, it's, it's, it works. It works really well. And then the other thing you can do is you can do a, a loving kindness. Um, just I, I leverage gratitude. I leverage gratitude a lot in my experiences. And when I am in person, I'll begin my experiences in a circle. I, I think the power of a circle uh, is, mm. is very underappreciated. But when you can see everyone, I, I get people to pause. I get people to just notice the other people in the room. I just get them to look around. And it's just silence. Mm -hmm. Sometimes there's a song in the background. And then what I'll do is I'll actually get people to just close their eyes and just appreciate that we're in this moment together mm. and that we're able to gather and we're able to share wisdom with one another and take a second to be grateful for all the knowledge and joy we have in this experience mm. and not take that for granted. Um, you know, so often we just... We're kind of sleepwalking through the, the the greatest conferences, the greatest shared experiences of our lives. And like we need to remind ourselves that these are finite experiences and they're some of the best experiences of our lives. And so bringing awareness to the possibilities when we come together and like the uniqueness and wisdom of every single human in this space mm. I like to get people into that mindset, into that gratitude mindset, and then that's when I'll introduce myself and, you know, clarify the intention and go through kind of a, a, an array of connection exercises, and, and that's kind of what I do in my experiences. So I love it. Yeah, I've, I've been to events where it's like the circle format, and you have yeah. to make eye contact with each person and just give like a nod when you see each other. So basically, each person has to make eye contact with each person. And once you've seen everybody, uh, you close your eyes. And yeah, the, the feeling of just like literally acknowledging eye to eye, again, that eye yeah. contact, the oxytocin that that releases, and then being present is huge. Um, and I love the the relaxation, the calm before you enter this social space of coming with that mentality. And I have an idea from this. Uh, imagine if every online community platform, so asynchronous platforms, not not necessarily events, could be events too. Actually, yeah, should be events too. Um, when you click to open, let's say Twitter or Discord or forum, the first thing that pops up says like, you are enti entering a community space. Please take three deep breaths. Imagine the change that would have on the internet and the world oh, and yeah. culture if before we got online into these like highly volatile spaces from a social context, we just had everyone take three deep breaths. Or, or David, even go farther and just show three three pictures of other members, three, three deep breaths, yeah. and then here are three people uh, just so you can see the other people that you're going to be sharing the space with and just like mm. automate some of the things that you just shared to get people into a pro social state before they enter yeah. these places online. Yeah, yeah. Um I'm I'm excited about that and the habit that you're sharing is the habit of checking in with ourselves before we engage in human connection. Mm -hmm. And you know, I've been wanting to do this more and more and I'm getting better at and, you know, really incorporating this into my life. But the habit is uh, when you are leading a group, before you are leading a group or before you are entering a community space, 
pause and check in with yourself because your mood and your stress is contagious and it's going to lead you to have uh, less nourishing human connections. Um, and so just that that habit, it's it's it just goes back to the basics. It's like life becomes easier when we're in a light, relaxed, joyful state and we have so many tools available to us to access that state and yet we're so rushed, I'm so rushed that I forget to do it. And mm. and for that reason, uh, people sometimes think I'm really impatient and uh, impersonal and that mm. is not who my ideal self is, you know? I love it. Um, okay. So, so you set the context for the room or for the group ahead of time. You give them their checklist. They come, you go through a ritual that focuses on pausing, having them become aware of themselves, aware of each other. Um, I think a lot of what we've discussed so far are kind of these small groups. Um, have you also designed experiences like this for really large groups? You mentioned like festivals or conferences or really large online communities. Definitely. We, yeah, definitely. And I, I, I really want to maximize the back and forth in my gatherings. Mm. And so once that back and forth is, is more, more regular, what happens is people's emotions build off each other for one thing and people are more engaged. And so I think one, you know, thing I think about a lot when I'm designing gatherings is how can I scale down the group size and mm -hmm. how can I produce interactions among the participants? How can I multiply the number of interactions happening in my gathering? And so, you know, when I was on stage at this jungle festival, as an example, I got everyone to get into huddles of eight. Mm -hmm. I got everyone into huddles of eight. And so everyone's huddling. And this is this is actually in March of 2020. So right before. Right at the start. Yeah, I came back right before. Wow. Well, <laughs> why eight? Every... <laughs> why eight? Yeah. Yeah. Eight. So there's there's a few things. When, when it's a nonverbal space, eight is a good number. Uh -huh. um, because it adds more emotional energy, especially when I'm trying to create a lot of joy. Mm -hmm. But when it's a verbal space, four is, a, uh, you know, I would say a max size is four people for a peer group. Interesting. And again, it's just the, the more people go back and forth, the more they're engaged and the mm -hmm. more that they can actually relate, right? So often a lecturer... I will talk for 10 minutes and then I won't give someone a chance to relate. And so there's no connection there. But see, one thing you've been really good at during this conversation, David, is you practice relating. There's a back and forth. You echo what I've said and then you share a story and mm -hmm. then you ask another question. So four, when we're kind of in more of this verbal space, but in the context of, uh, you know, joy and dance and singing, um, eight works as well. And so, you know, there's eight people in a circle and they're singing a song together and then they all put their hands in for a cheer at the end. And that's when, you know, like the music goes off and people start start dancing a little wildly. So that, that's what you did at the festival. You had them all go into groups of eight and then and then that's how like it kicked off into the music. They kind of connected with each other in small groups and then you yep. brought them into the larger experience. Yes, and I love that. one thing I also wanted to share is uh, related to this idea of witnessing, right? You mentioned you just look them in the eyes, give them a nod. Being seen, being witnessed. You know, we think of psychological safety as perhaps a little too technical. Mm. Maybe psychological safety is just being witnessed and mm. seen and celebrated. And so my favorite activity for this and this is how I this is how I started my workshop here at this uh, hotel in Miami um, I did a standing ovation mm -hmm. you get people to walk up stand in front of the crowd and everyone gives a standing ovation 
I love it. And it transformed the room. Transformed the room. It was magical. And I, I learned many, that from people? someone. There were oh yeah, yeah. No, we did like we did five people, but there were about like forty people in the room. Okay. So you know, but then again we could we could scale down. We could scale down that and right. have a group of eight people taking turns, right? Right. You five um, stand up and the whole room will cheer for you. I yeah. love that. Yeah. Uh we do that at CMX Summit. We do standing ovations for every speaker. Um like guaranteed you get I have everyone yeah. practice at first. So it makes all of our speakers come out like, wow, I've never had an opening standing ovation. And we also do standing ovation or we do like ovations for our people who come to our event for the first time. We'll have them all stand up and they get a huge round of applause from the audience. Um I think so much of like the loneliness epidemic that we're seeing today is that a lot a lot of the groups we're in are very large. It's so easy to be surrounded by people who are living in a big city, right? Like I remember living in New York, mo- more people than you can imagine all around you. And yet you could feel so alone because nobody sees you. They all walk right past you. And so creating ex- explicit experiences where you have people pause mm. and see each other makes them feel valued mm. and seen and recognized. Like they're not just lost in the mess of this thousand person conference or, or large virtual event. Yeah. Yeah. Building off of that too. I think that when we're in a big crowd, we're anonymous. Absolutely. And this, this idea of anonymity in internet communities, where is the accountability? Where is the drive to be an altruist Mm -hmm. when you're anonymous? And there's actually a wonderful, highly technical book that I read by Robert Axelrod. It's called The Evolution of Cooperation. Mm. And one of the findings of his research is that when you are super geographically mobile, um, when, when, when someone is more geographically mobile, they're more likely to screw people over. Mm. And so this, this anonymity, uh, I really think, damages our subscription to social norms and it makes us less altruistic so so there's that piece to these large experiences where is the accountability when you're super anonymous and then the second piece is um attention when you're in a super massive gathering you're just so distracted i mean this is what i experienced when i was in vegas david i was in vegas and I was walking around looking at how people were connecting and I truly believe that like if I can, maybe my my life mission is to like transform Vegas and that, if I can do that, <laughs> if I can transform the idea of Vegas, then, then I will be, uh, I will be able to die happily. <laughs> but uh, the, the principle here is that the more distractions there are, the mm. less attention we can have on one other human. And so I think in mm. these much larger groups, there's just so many uh, distractions, so many people to connect with. So there isn't that recurring trust building. Um, so group size, and, and this is the whole philosophy of scaling down. It's how mm. do we create recurring encounters? Mm, I love that. Yeah. And and it, it aligns with a lot of community psychology and community theory of um, like, how do you scale community? Well, you can't just keep growing the group size. You need to find ways of breaking it down. And that's where people launch local chapters or small groups or subgroups like Reddit becomes millions of subreddits. And so communities are going to keep kind of having this mitosis. They're going to keep splitting and forming smaller and smaller groups. But us as community organizers can facilitate that experience. Um, yeah. yeah, I'm curious if, uh, you've seen any, or you've applied any good techniques for, um, the welcome experience at, at a large event. I always feel like that's a missed opportunity at conferences. Oh, yeah. Cause you like show up and it's usually the worst part of the event, right? You show up, you don't know where to go and you have to wait in line. And then like, you have to show your ID 
And there's someone there who's like kind of frustrated because they've been dealing with checking people in all day and they give you get the badge in your bag or whatever and you move on. Um, and it's such like a missed opportunity to, again, set that tone and put people in a pro social mood. Oh, yeah. I think oh, yeah. of things like Burning Man where you show up and, you know, you roll around in the dust and uh, and then have you hit a gong and there's a welcome welcomer there to like answer your questions and welcome you to the community and set the tone. So is there anything that you've seen, especially in like more professional settings, work really well for setting that pro social mood in really large in person events? Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I've been to a lot of conferences, but uh, conferences haven't impressed me much. So <laughs> no memory, no memory is coming to mind. Um, but I've I've participated in that process. I've been hired to do that uh, for festivals and for uh, events, not for professional events, sure. but I really yeah. think festivals um, too, right? Like the the entering experience is usually awful. Like you wait in line oh, yeah. and you go through security. It's like super antisocial. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. I really think the question we need to ask ourselves is who is the first person that our guest interacts with and how, what is the nature of that interaction? Mm -hmm. And I think w what often is the nature of that interaction is we need to get you checked in as quickly as possible so you can go to the speaker and sit down with the speaker. Like, I think it's rushed. Um, you know, what, what I love to do, what, what my dream welcome experience would be, uh, would be com creating small groups of guests who don't know each other and having a little micro ritual where people maybe form a huddle or they're in a breakout room and they share one thing they're excited about with mm. the conference or they share their intention or it's just, uh, you know, one person goes in the middle and, uh, you know, says, says uh, a fun fact about themselves, right? It's, we so often mm. think a lot about what we're saying, but most what's more important is how we're feeling and whether people are celebrating our expression mm. and so the principle here the principle here for a dream entrance into a professional event is celebrating another person's uniqueness and expression mm. and if we can do that with a group of guests we can create new social norms for the event yeah. Um, so I think that would transform things. Of course, like if there's a slide, if there's a slide, it makes things better. Slides if would there's be good. movement, like physical Balloons, energy. Perhaps. I'm a big. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Or uh, you know, maybe uh, maybe a mini trampoline. I, I love. Mm. I'm a big fan of the trampolines. I like for that. Uh, for activating people and kind of re reawakening the swim child through a, a ball pit. To enter the conference, <laughs> that could be good. Um, but these these activities, um, they 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 show us that we don't have to be worried about our status, and we don't have to show off. And I I think that this is the great irony of trying to look our best, mm -hmm. because oftentimes when we try to look our best. We threaten other people. We don't create safety for other people when we're trying to look our best. Mm. And so, you know, that that's why I dress all vibrantly. And, <laughs> um, you model yeah. the behavior. I love it. And and I dance. I dance intentionally poorly. You see, David. <laughs> intentionally poorly, <laughs> of course. Um, yeah, yeah. So on on the topic of fun. Uh, what are some very specific practical things that you've done or you recommend people do to bring more fun into their community events and experiences? Yeah, certainly. Well, what's coming to mind is just the importance of the importance of noticing when other people are expressing themselves and celebrating that. Um, I think I think for fun, there's a few there's a few 
techniques that I incorporate into all my experiences. Um, I am, I, I've, stu- I, you know, I have a database of like 300 different games and exercises and activities. Um, I think fun uh, or joyful sentence stems that give people a chance to talk about what what's exciting them or what's bringing them joy that's really really simple um what's, so what's as a, a sentence check-in, stem? a sentence stem is like in my life blank is bringing me a lot of joy that's mm. a sentence stem so it's a structured prompt that people it's a structured in. prompt mm. now one of the best ones of those i ever yeah. had was uh, you wouldn't know this by looking at me but ah uh, that's right yeah, I, I like that one too. Uh, there's a great authentic relating game where you go back and forth. Authentic relating is a, a modality. It's like a human connection meditation practice. There's a game and it's called If You Really Knew Me, You'd Know. I'm sure mm, you've yeah. heard this game before. Is that right? <laughs> yeah. Uh, and then, of course, there's there's dyads where you ask people the same question back and forth over and over again for like half an hour. That's, that's an interesting, uh, self-development modality as well. Like what now? What would that question be? Oh yeah. Yeah. I've done them. I've done them for all sorts of stuff for, for regrets, for money beliefs, um, for defining, uh, my ideal self. Uh, it really just gets you deeper and deeper to the true right. answer. Right. Um, now I could see that being useful in a community if we're defining, uh, perhaps our community agreements, Sure. but also we could just do it as a deeper icebreaker exercise totally. for 10 yeah. minutes. I think um, people answer questions over and over again, makes them go deeper. Like actually I learned yeah. about that. One question was in, um, Ashanti, Ashanti, I think his name was that, uh, did the taking off the mask workshop. And so we went wow. in a circle and said, you wouldn't know this by looking at me, but, and we just kept going in a circle and it started with like, you would yeah. know this about me, but I eat cereal for breakfast every day, or I like to play basketball. And then all it took is one person going deep and saying like, you wouldn't know this about me, but I lost my father when I was three. And and from that point on, there wasn't a single shallow response. And it just kept getting yep. deeper and deeper and deeper because you'd have to keep answering the question. And it's like, well, they share that. Now I want to share something deep. I'm not going to talk about like a sport that I play now. Um, so it's a really, mm-hmm. really impactful mm-hmm. tool for going deeper and reflecting much more deeply. Yeah. Yeah. And the the first person to go deep raises or or lowers the threshold exactly. for what is acceptable right mm-hmm. and as leaders we have so much control over that threshold if you're like hosting a gathering you have such such a power to to change that threshold totally. to dictate the social norms and uh, so it just boggles my mind that we have all these hyper professional serious uh, leaders when there's just so much potential. There's so much potential for more meaningful human connection if if uh, leaders kind of, yeah, it's it's complicated. It's complicated and it's contextual <laughs> to the culture. <laughs> well, but um, yeah, I, I, I could tell that we we're similar in that you know we we talked about like how do we add more fun and and somehow we still get back to things that make it just go really deep and reflect. Like I think that's fun for me and you. <laughs> Like yeah, this is fun. Let's let's like deeply reflect on our identities and yeah, <laughs> and our trauma. Um, but um, but no, I, I think like having games, like using games, is, is a really effective thing. Is, is that list of three hundred games? Is that like a public resource you share, or is that just your own personal arsenal? Yeah, yeah. Just if you're listening to this and you want to broaden your toolkit of games and exercises for joy just send me an email or get in touch with me somehow and I'll send you I'll send you the excel sheet um there's two there's two other games that are coming to mind right now and uh two other modalities for joy and I think the first one that um we don't appreciate I I don't I don't find this in a lot of gatherings 
gatherings is storytelling. And when we have the chance to tell a story about um, a fun moment in our lives or a joyful moment in our lives, uh, I actually learned about the power of storytelling from uh, the Surgeon General uh, who wrote a book about loneliness. And he calls this game the inside scoop, the Mm. inside scoop. And simply you share a story from your life in front of your team. And usually it's really personal. It's attached to a photo or video. And what I've done in the past is I've hosted storytelling nights about some of the happiest moments in our lives or something we're really, really proud of. Um, And just creating that space for people to share something that Maybe it wouldn't be appropriate to share mm. if if it wasn't a storytelling episode. Um, and then and then of course there's all the different improv games as well. Yes. Um, like yes and mm. I you know at the beginning of all my sessions when I'm talking about party design is I get people to imagine great events by using yes and. And I just get people into this imaginative yeah. and space. And there will be ball pits and balloons and a slide. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. I love it. Yeah. Yeah, I highly yeah, recommend I, anyone who wants more games to just take a few improv classes. I, mm, did, a, I did about mm. a year of it and so much fun. And like, I wish I like wrote down every game we played in there because every time we did it, I'm like, <laughs> oh, this would be good for our community events. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, you know, and then... I, I'd love to hear your insight on this too. Um, and it's it's so hard to navigate this conversation with virtual and physical, but in yeah. physical events, I will put on a song and I will just have people walk around and high five each other. <laughs> and it's so simple, but it's like, it involves touch. It yeah, involves eye touch. contact. It's witnessing. And it's literally, it's low barrier. And this is the thing, like when we're in, working in professional environments, we need to meet people where they're at. And so to lower that barrier to participation as low as possible, just people have, have people walk around the room and give out high fives, you know? And then maybe the next step is uh, give people a hip check, right? People, mm. I see people laughing all the time when they, <laughs> that's of course a little more sensitive. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. That's reserved for yeah. Steve Ballmer and Microsoft. <laughs> and um, then the, the final step, the final step is crowd surf therapy. Not sure if you've tried that before, David, but a uh, very powerful wow. human connection modality. <laughs> so you have people crowd surf, of course. I have crowd surfed at concerts. Haven't tried it as a co- at a conference yet, but yeah. you know, a lot of liability at a conference. <laughs> when when the right intention and context is set, uh, crowd surfing can be an incredibly team bonding experience. Uh, unfortunately, you know, when the picture of crowd surfing comes up, it's, it's, you know, some punk rocker jumping into a crowd, you know? Sure. Yeah. It's more, <laughs> more aggressive. Um, yeah, I yeah. agree. Yeah. I think I've seen Tony Robbins do it at his events. Uh, he makes everyone Definitely. crowd surf someone and then they land and they just feel incredible. <laughs> yeah. And then, then the testimonial video begins. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Have you ever have you ever been to a Tony Robbins event, by the way? I was thinking of attending this one in Miami. Uh, oh. I think Tony Robbins is the best example for using party technologies to yeah. create transformation. It's, I think he is the expert. It's unreal. I've been to an event. Don't agree with everything he says or teaches. Yep. Like, you know, but that event, wow, was that like social architecture master class. Oh, yeah. From the music to the way he gets people to interact with each other to just everything was everything we talked about today. He's he's just like, I really think every community builder should just go to an event. I mean, I yeah. got a ton of value out of it, too. Like, it was it was incredible for me. Um, and just the the way he gets people to interact and engage, like the feelings that you feel at that event are just so expertly done. Yeah. Uh, yeah, is there is there a tool or activity that you've taken from Tony Robbins and implemented into some of your talks and workshops? 
That's a good question. Um, I mean, he did a lot of uh, uh, really simply like turn to your partner and talk about something. So I do a lot yeah. of that. Um, just having people interact and um, and talk to each other, uh, share their reflection from an exercise they just did, um, that kind of like small group work. Mm -hmm. um, I think like the things I've tried around breath work and things like that. He did a lot of breath work all throughout it. Um, some he did he does a lot of visualization, um, yeah. and I've done that sometimes. Like, all right, if you want to design your community, like do a visualization exercise of what does it look like, what does it feel like, how do you feel, where are you in the room, things like that. Um, you know, I wish I had the production team he had to do like the the lights and the music that that he uses to, you know, get everyone engaged. Um, getting off yeah. the stage is something I started doing more. Uh, at, at events is like literally yeah. jumping off the stage and like walking around the room and talking to people. He he does a ton of that, you know, just like getting out, breaking that fourth wall. Um, and you know, if you <laughs> there are things there, if you want to get real deep, we can really talk about like how he gets people to cry and share things that they like have never shared before in front of a room of 10,000 people. It's just, it's wild. It's a lot yeah, of yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I I love that you bring up you know what's coming to mind. Visualization and movement are movement, things yeah. Tony Robbins applies, and so often we can elevate joy in a room just by getting people up, standing, opening their body posture, absolutely, and like moving a little bit, you know, absolutely. And one thing that I'll do and. Actually, David, so I'm jumping off this call with you and I'm leading a virtual party. And one thing nice. I do is I get people to grab an item in their house. And so like I have this stack of paper plates and then I get people to like do different exercise movements with it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and so it's just it's just silly and it's elevating people's heart rates. Absolutely. And it's getting people engaged and, and everyone's usually laughing. One session I did, David, someone was holding an Olympic torch. Like a literal one. <laughs> yeah. Oh my God. You never know what kind of objects they have lying around. Oh my um, gosh. That I love good. that. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, he uses that to an extreme because it, I mean, it's, Absurd. All the things that people say you need to do in an event of like give people breaks and give them breathing room and time. No, you don't, you don't have a minute. Like they don't even give you lunch time. If you go to lunch, wow. you're going to miss the content. Um, wow. And he does that on purpose, like by day three and it's three, four day event by day three, you're just like in a zombie mode, which is probably part of why you're so influenceable. <laughs> um, <laughs> but, um, yeah. but the way he like keeps you energized and going is to be like, all right, stop play the music and he gets every, everyone up and you have to be like clapping. And so if you've ever seen videos of Tony Robbins events where like, you're like, wow, these people look out of their minds screaming and clapping. They look like idiots. That's how I felt too. Like the first day I like wasn't really doing it. I was kind of half assing it and I was like judging everybody around me. And I was like really feeling like an outsider looking in yep. Um, in part because I was there, you know, f not for no reason to, but just to like, um, you know, observe the community dynamics of it. Not necessarily, I was like, I don't really need Tony Robbins. I'm just here to learn and observe how he does it. Um, but then like day two, I'm like, well, you know what? I'm here like today. I'm going to like let loose and like really lean into it. And I went with a group of friends and the second day we decided to sit separately from each other. So we weren't um, self-conscious that's another big social design yeah. thing is if people oh, sit next yeah. to people they know, they're much less likely to engage in the larger social experience that they're having. And so we separated so we wouldn't be embarrassed by each other um, and like just like lean into it. And by the end, like, yeah, I was clapping and screaming and dancing. And once you like let loose and get into it, you don't care if you look silly because everyone around you looks silly and you're just kind of having fun with it. Um, wow. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, you I got feel like snared. <laughs> I did, yeah. Well, you know, I didn't, I didn't pull out my credit card, which is where they really get you. Literally, it's oh, wild because they're, when he starts doing the upsell to the other programs, I kid you not, there are people running down the aisles with their credit card in hand to get to the tables wow. first.
to sign up for like his business course and like his next event and all. I'm just yeah. I did not do that, so I didn't get completely roped in. But it is wild how immersed people get in it. Like they just want that feeling again. I, I met people who've been to that same exact event with the same exact format like ten times, and I asked wow. them why they do that, and they said you know, would you go see Michael Jordan as many times as you could while he played? Like this guy is a Michael Jordan of what he does. And I just want to see yep. him do it. So like, mm-hmm. it's, it's absurd. Anyway, enough on Tony yeah, Robbins. Yeah. And I feel like you and I can geek out on, on all of these. I even have more, but we'll, we'll I have to get you to your virtual party and we, we <laughs> have to get through this rapid fire question round of the chat. Uh, do you, still, you still have time for the rapid fire question round? Definitely. Yeah. And, and just the final comment I'll make on Tony Robbins is I, I think we as community builders, we need to realize that within every gathering, there is the possibility of a peak experience. And so often we just accept the default way of gathering. Mm. But you know, what, what is going to generate that those loyal community members is intense emotions. And, you know, I guess this is just a call out for, for, for community builders to maybe step into more of that facilitation Mm. facilitator peak experience creator. Um, because I think that is one of the highest forms of engagement is when people are communicating in real time face to face in our community. And that's that's when the identity toward the community forms. And that's when the glue, the loyalty forms in our communities. And so uh, Tony Robbins is is great at creating these rituals and that that produce the shared identity. Absolutely. So, yeah. That's like the fire, the walking on hot coals. It's like exactly that. It's like a peak moment that everyone remembers. Um, yeah. Great book on that. I'm sure you read it. Dan and Chip Heath's uh, The Power of Moments. Um, really, oh, yeah. really good book. They they spoke at a, a past CMX Summit um, event. So lots of ideas in there of how to create these peak moments that people will remember from your events. Um, all right. Love it. Let's dive into this rapid fire question round. You ready? I am ready. Good. Great. Grand, let's go. Number one, if you could only eat one food for the rest of your life, what would that food be? According to the inflammatory factor ratings, it would be mackerel. Mackerel? (laughs) I'm a biohacker, David. Come on. Oh, my goodness. Like the fish? (laughs) Yeah. Just mackerel. All right. Just mackerel. That's the weirdest answer I've gotten to that question. I love it. Okay. Next question. What's the best party you've ever been to? It is the roaming citywide decentralized dance party, which also introduced me to Bitcoin back in 2016. Decentralized parties lead to decentralized governance and finance. Makes sense. Love it. All right. (laughs) Next question. What's your favorite book to give as a gift to others? Conflict Equals Energy by Jason Diggs. This is a book, an introductory book on authentic relating, which will overhaul how you view human connection and how you connect with others. <laughs> Love it. So many good book recommendations in this one. We'll, we'll have them all in the show notes for everyone. Uh, all right. Uh, what's your morning routine? Mm, it's long. But uh, what's like the three up, big steps? <laughs> I wake up and I imagine that I've been revived from the grave. Oh, I like that. I go outside. I look at the sun, do some stretches, uh, and then I do some inversion. Followed nice. by the last step is a loving kindness meditation. So I will bless someone. I will wish someone well in my life. Hmm. Yeah, I really like that. Mm-hmm. I like all of those things. I'm going to try them. I do like the imagining that I just came back from the dead thing and just like you look at your hands or like imagine you're an alien <laughs> that just like got to live a human experience and it's the first time yeah. you're looking at your hand. Uh, it really makes you feel a lot more present. I like mm-hmm. it. Um, we've, I mean, we had so many in this one, but I have to still ask, what's a go-to engagement tactic or conversation starter you like to use in your communities? Do you have like one that, you know, when things are really stale you know you could come back to this one 
really, really stale, hey? Um, yeah, I, I would say that I get people moving. Uh, I think movement and, and also contextualizing it as movement instead of dancing is really important. Mm. Mm. Forgot to mention uh, another thing I do in the breath work. I do stretches, especially right after lunch oh, at yeah. a conference. I get everyone to just do really basic stretch with me and I do it on stage. Again, people absolutely love it. All right, next question. We talked about how to start a party. We started about a lot of experiences to create at your event. What's the best way to end a party? So it is essentially a standing ovation, but I call it the unconditional round of applause. I encourage my participants to come forth with recognitions for others, something they're grateful for, something that is inspiring them. And I have had the most vulnerable, open-hearted shares uh, mm. by, by all ages in virtually virtually as well mm, love that and then also I, I like the bear hug but you know that's not not permitted at this time that's right no bear hugs during covid <laughs> air hugs not bear hugs <laughs> uh what's a community or event product or piece of technology that you wish existed yeah um so i really wish there was a device, uh, uh, basically a, a plugin to Spotify that enabled you to choose songs that are just like universally applicable for different moods and different contexts. Mm. Um, so I, I wish there was more research on that because, uh, like I said, I've played Whitney Houston, I Will Always Love You in like 13 countries and always always cultivates laughter and closeness it's maybe, magical maybe that's it that's the playlist it's just i will always love you about it. <laughs> done applicable to all situations sadness happiness just play with you <laughs> what is the weirdest community you've ever been a part of Speaking of Tony Robbins, uh, I have been a part of the silent meditation retreat community. Ooh. It's called Vipassana. And it's interesting because the community forms in silence with no eye contact. It's it's purely shared suffering. <laughs> yeah. That's really cool. I've always wanted to do a, a silent retreat. I haven't done it yet. Now that I have a kid, it's going to be harder to oh. say, hey, I'm going to go to the woods for 10 days to be silent but one day it is it is maybe the only thing on my bucket list right now right on so I'll, I'll you'll have to invite me one day definitely last question if you were to find yourself on your deathbed today and you, d you had to condense all of your life lessons into one piece of advice to the rest of the world on how to live what would that advice be your quality of life is predicted by the quality of your human connections so train your human connection skills and just mm. comment on this. I don't think we think about human connection skills as important as they are. I think mm. we, we focus a lot on mindfulness. We focus a lot on our physical health, what we eat, but I truly think like, man, if we, if we can produce more joy and depth in our human connections and relationships, Ooh, where we can have nothing and still be happy. I agree wholeheartedly. And I think that is great advice. One that I think everyone here will embody. Um, and as community builders, just make sure you take care of your own connections as well. Sometimes in community building roles, we're so focused oh, on yeah. everyone else forming healthy relationships. We sometimes lose sight of our own. So mm -hmm. Jacques, this was an absolute pleasure. I have very much enjoyed geeking out with the party scientist on social design and architecture and science. This I could do this all day, and I think we'll probably have to do it again sometime because I feel like we we could just keep going. I'll attend one of your parties, and uh, you attend one of mine. That sounds good. I, yeah, I will. I will be there, ready to make eye contact. <sighs> eye gazing. Yeah. I, For oh, sure. I did eye gazing once at, at a experience your own death event 
that's for another oh my podcast. Gosh. We'll, we'll, we'll talk about that <laughs> one later. But part of it was eye gazing for five minutes with a stranger. And mm. that was, that was something. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I love that. I love that, David. I've enjoyed this sincerely. I've enjoyed your questions and, uh, uh, I hope to, um, you know, continue becoming a, a better community facilitator. Thanks to you and the, the great community you built. Well, likewise, I think, uh, everyone who listened to this will end up with better communities as a result. So for that, I'm, I'm really grateful. Appreciate you taking the time to chat with me and share all of your wisdom and your lessons. Um, finally, where can people go to continue to learn from you and, and find your work? Yeah, if you want to learn how to facilitate fun and joy, I have a bunch of free resources on my website, thepartyscientist.fun. Love it. Awesome. Well, thanks, everybody. Hope you enjoy this episode. We'll see you next time. Woo!